Welcome everyone to Settlement Nation. I am Courtney Barber and today I'm joined by my co-host Chris Bua, as well as a very special guest, Amy Wagstaff, the founding partner of Andrus Wagstaff from Denver, Colorado. Now, Amy has dedicated her professional life fighting against pharmaceutical and medical device companies. The vast majority of her litigation is done through national mass tort consolidations, and she has been appointed by federal and state court judges across the country to co-lead four national litigations, representing tens of thousands of injured claimants. In addition, and something that we're going to cover today, just last year, Amy was the lead trial counsel in the only federal roundup trial resulting in an $80 million plus verdict on behalf of a California man who developed non-Hodgkin's lymphoma after decades of exposure to this product produced by Monsanto. So welcome, Amy. Thank you, Courtney. And thank you, Chris, for having me. I'm really excited to be here. Oh, we're super excited to have you. And this is our first episode that we've had that is focusing on mass torts and someone that works basically specifically in this industry. So we're super happy to have you. I know you're a very busy lady, but uh, we just can't wait to dive straight in. And on that note, Amy, give us a little bit of your background story about how you even started practicing law. Yeah, so I grew up in Kansas and I came from, I come from a long line of lawyers in my family that were mostly male. In fact, they were all male. I'm the first female lawyer. And my dad, my brother, my uncles, my grandparent, my grandfather, his brother, um, all up and down the line of, of male lawyers. So I kind of grew up um, with a with a law family, but I am, um, as you get to know me and, and my friends in the law and around me say I'm the most unlawyerly lawyer you'll probably ever meet. <laughs> Um, I, you know, I don't fit that the mold of what people think as a lawyer. And I think that's part of what's helped me be successful and helped me find my niche in the law. I, when I graduated college, I, um, I graduated from the University of San Diego and I went into club, I was, a, went to Club Med as a sailing instructor and I was a sailing instructor at Club Med for almost two years in Florida at, uh, in Port St. Lucie. And then I got transferred to Cancun, Mexico for almost a year and then I came out and I moved to Denver um, the night before 9-11. So I've been here about 20 or so years. And I went I went to law school out here. Um, I started to uh, I started in the defense bar, which was, you know, you wake up and you put on a suit and you go to the office and you spend all day working at your desk and then you come home and you just bill, bill, bill. And once I finally moved over to the plaintiff side, which was about three years into my practice is where I finally found my home in the law. And um, being a plaintiff's lawyer is definitely much more suited to my style and and the life I want to lead than um, than any sort of law that I did prior to that. So, Amy, what attracted you or made you want to focus specifically on mass tort cases? Um, well, I sort of fell into it. Um, you know, for those people who have gone to law school, uh, you'll know that they don't really teach you about mass torts in law school. Um, and they, they do now because some people who have been, some law schools do now because people who have um, been successful in mass torts have started to go back and be adjunct professors or walk you through a mass tort. But basically what a mass tort is, and it's different than a class action. And what a mass tort it is, mass tort is, is a tort is a non-contractual harm, right? So a tort is something that you didn't contract with someone that you wouldn't do. When you get in a car wreck, you don't have a contract with that person that you, that they wouldn't hit your car. If I were to punch you in the face, you know, you and I don't have a contract. I wouldn't do that, but those are all torts. That's negligence. That's assault. Those are all torts. And so, a mass tort is when a company and I, I do mass torts that are sometimes as little as 10 or 15 people. Right. If a school bus drives off the road, you know, there's no contract that you have with the, the driver that they won't drive off the road. Or there's no contract with, um, you know, that the people on the bus have with the, the servicer of the bus that you'll keep it up to date. But there's just certain things you have to do. So a mass tort can be as little as 10 people, you know, who get injured on a, a bus where a wheel falls off to a plane that goes down and all the people are injured to what what we really do in my law firm is uh, medical devices and manufacturers of pills uh, who put um, defective um, products and pills out in the marketplace. And then as recently as uh, my last tort that I did was against a pesticide company, Monsanto, who put um, 
a, you know, a toxic chemical out there into the world. So that's sort of what we do. The way that I got into it was um, I was working in a defense firm. I graduated law school in 2005 and I was working in a defense firm. Um, and, and I remember it was when Obama was getting elected and the DNC was in Denver. It was a very political firm I worked for. And shortly after um, the, the DNC feels like it was just yesterday. The firm imploded for several different reasons, depending on who you ask. Um, and my, I told you I came from a long line of lawyers. And so I was introduced through one of my dad's um, colleagues. My dad pract practiced law in Kansas City. And I was introduced to one of his colleagues out here named Vance Andrus, who is my current law partner. Um, I'm 44 years old and, my, and he is 30 years older than me, 74. Um, and we became partners shortly after that in late 2008, early 2009. Um, and we have just been partners ever since. We started our law firm at the end of 2009, and we've uh, had our law firm now for 12 years. And he does almost exclusively mass torts. So that's kind of how I got into it. And it was just by luck of the draw. And really, mass torts um, fits my skill set as a lawyer um, for a lot of different reasons. And it it is a I find it a very enjoyable practice of law. Of all the lawyers in the whole country, I would say there are probably, you know, 200, you know, lawyers who actually really practice mass tort law. So it's a small group of people and more people are getting into it, but a lot of people get into it and they don't actually do the litigating part. They don't actually take the depositions, try the cases. And so it's a, it's a small group of people. It's a little fraternity of lawyers who do very high risk litigation. That's really interesting. As Courtney mentioned, you are the first mass torts attorney uh, to come on Settlement Nation. And one of the common themes we've heard from our other guests who handle individual tort claims is that they really get connected on a human and emotional level with their clients. Is that something you're even able to do in these environments when you're representing hundreds or even thousands of clients on a case? And if so, like, how do you do that to fuel yourself throughout the case? Yeah. So it's, it's a different type of relationship that you have. Um, I tell a lot of my clients that one of the elements of their damage in a mass tort is that they've hurt so many people and they take away that um, that uniqueness of being damaged or injured, right? I mean, when you, when you have one client and you do a single event case, the facts are unique to that client. The damages are unique to that client. When you do a, a, a case, um, you know, I had a, a vaginal mesh. I did vaginal mesh where there was probably two hundred or three hundred thousand clients, right? And so that's a that's an element of the damage. You, there's no possible way you could try all those cases. There's no possible way that you could know all of those clients. My firm obviously didn't have all those clients. That was nationwide. Um, but when what does happen in mass torts and the way that mass torts get settled is there's something called the bellwether process where you pull clients out of the group. And how those clients get picked is um, probably more detailed than we have uh, time for in this podcast. But Mr. Hardiman, who you referenced, Courtney, earlier is a good example of that. Um, you know, I formed a very close connection with Mr. Hardiman. His trial was about a year and a half ago, and I still talk to him, you know, two or three times a week. And so, um, you know, we, we, we form very close bonds with someone. And the way that you do that is just you go through their journey with them. And so, you know, of the clients, like in Roundup right now in the MDL, Judge Chabria has pulled out wave cases. He's, he's identified four wave cases. And so those clients, you know, that's about 10 or 11 clients that get pulled out. I worked up Charlene Gordon's case in in St. Louis and you get close to her, but you know, you, it is a different bond that you have with the other, um, the other people, because like I said, that's just one of the unfortunate aspects of being injured by a product that the company has also injured hundreds of thousands of other people. Right. And Amy, on that point and talking about the Monsanto case, there's a lot of plaintiff attorneys that we have. And as you mentioned, it's such a small group of people that do focus on this and they may never in their career ever be involved in a mass torts case or even practice this. But can we go back to that case and start off with the beginning? How did uh, this client come to you? How did this whole thing begin? Yeah, I was actually having um, lunch with a colleague lawyer um, who was down in Colorado Springs, and she told me about 
um, this IARC finding, finding that glyphosate was a possible carcinogen and glyphosate is the active ingredient in Roundup. Um, and I didn't think much of it. And I talked with one of my colleagues about it and we started um, investigating, you know, what, what that meant. And we knew that Roundup was so widely used. And then, you know, my law firm only has eight lawyers. And so we started partnering up with lawyers around the country and one by one, they all sort of dropped off and said it was too hard or that it wouldn't work or that the science wasn't there. And part of the reason of that is because, you know, Roundup has been around since the the seventies and make no mistake. um, You know, Monsanto has spent decades putting their fingerprint all over the fabric, waiting for this day to come when there would be people who would lift up the covers and, and see what was underneath. And so this wasn't like any other case where you could take the, the science and the words of the science at face value. You had to really see the conflict of interest and see who was paying the bill and follow the, the money trail and see where versions got changed or edited and see attachments to email, how they were sent to Monsanto in one way. And they left Monsanto's email with important words deleted. And you kept doing that over and over again. And it was a very difficult um, litigation. And, and there, there ended up being about six law firms, five or six law firms that really banded together the Miller firm, uh, Baum Headland, Weitz and Luxembourg and us really led the litigation um, uh, for four or five years. And then, you know, eventually we get to trial and we've had three trials and the, the, these trials are, um, really a thing of beauty. They're unlike anything you've ever experienced as a lawyer. You do a two month trial outside of your home, living in a hotel with, you know, 15 other lawyers who you don't work with, uh, in, in that law firm. And so, um, everyone's just there focused on the task at hand and you literally work on this trial, you know, 15, 16 hours a day, prepping, ex- prepping witnesses, being in the courtroom, arguing cases, putting on witnesses, and then you put it all in the hands of the jury. And um, it's really an overwhelming experience. But, you know, those trials are, gosh, they can cost anywhere from 500, 500,000 to a million dollars just to get to the trial, just to get to the courthouse steps. And then, you know, the more money that you pay as well. And so people see these big verdicts um, in mass torts, but they don't realize, you know, how much risk and how much effort has gone into them uh, and, and how much sacrifice by our clients uh, to be the face of these. That's, that's what's really important. You know, Mr. Hardiman became the face of this litigation and he certainly didn't ask to be that it was sort of thrust upon him and there's, you know, different positives and negatives that come with that. And then the, of the lawyers and the staff and their families who sacrifice as well. Absolutely. And speaking about Mr. Hardiman, what was unique about him and his case for say others that also had um, experiences with Roundup and the effects of that? Well, what was unique about him is that he got a trial date, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and so the, the federal case was bifurcated into two phases where the two state court cases, which is uh, in part why the verdicts were a little bit bigger, was that they got to show more evidence in the state court cases. But in the in the federal case, you know, we, we had we had to do two trials to the same jury. Um, Mr. Hardiman uh, is from Sonoma County uh, and he uh, had a big plot of land. Um, and he w- he was a res- residential sprayer. He just went out there and sprayed all the time for many years. Um, it, he had uh, some some uh, confounding medical conditions that Monsanto tried to blame it on, um, but the jury kind of saw through that argument. But the jury was out for a full week. Um, you know, I mean these 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 trials aren't easy. You have to have a unanimous jury, and every day we had to sit in the courthouse and wait for the jury to come back. And it took them an entire week and over a weekend as well. So um, that's sort of what makes makes him unique. And we're still in the appellate process with him. We just argued to the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals. Uh, my law partner, David Wool did um, a couple weeks ago. And then Monsanto has vowed that they will take it to the United States Supreme Court, which I have no doubt that they will. Um, so Mr. Hardiman's case is, is actually only about halfway done. So, Amy, as a result of either these injuries or these individual cases, has Monsanto changed anything about their practices or their product? Um, it's hard. To, it's hard to say that they've changed their practices yet. Um, 
There is some discussion about them changing their label. Um, they have not changed their label yet. Um, there is some discussion about them changing um, some of their uh, ingredients in the Roundup. I'm not sure they've done that yet either. Um, it's certainly brought awareness to the to the actual product. I mean, in the United States, you are allowed um, to sell dangerous products, right? I mean, cigarettes, you know, other chemicals, you're allowed to sell dangerous products. That's not the problem. The problem is, I mean, that is a problem, but that's not the problem. The problem is the failure to warn. So, you know, if they were to put a warning on there that it causes cancer, then that would, you know, change a lot of the litigation because then people can make an informed decision on what they want to do, right? I mean, that, that that's the whole cigarette analogy. I mean, you know, cigarette companies have box, have warnings on their boxes saying this will kill you, right? But people who still choose to do it, that's, that's your right as an American to do that. Um, so this litigation is not over yet. There's still some um, a lot of pending cases out there. And so we are hopeful that Monsanto will do the right thing in the future and, and change their practices. So what is it like taking on a huge corporation like Monsanto? I went online to check and it looks like their market cap is north of 50 billion. Um, when I'm envisioning the courtroom, I'm envisioning rows of attorneys that are essentially armed guns firing at you and your clients. What is it like taking on that army of attorneys? Yeah, so um, it was exciting, but um, you're absolutely right in what you're envisioning. I tried the case with a, a friend of mine named Jennifer Moore, and she's out of Kentucky, Louisville, Kentucky. I brought her in the case about a month before, um, and she helped me try it. And at, at one point, um, Monsanto had more attorneys in the courtroom, actually in the courtroom, uh, than Jennifer and I had in our two law firms combined. Um, they had, you know, massive, massive uh, law firms behind them, sparing no expense. Um, you know, but as, as when you can only do so much when you have, you know, the facts like we had and the science supporting us like we had, but it's absolutely true. I mean, they have all the resources you could ever ask for, um, to, to, to defend themselves. And, you know, their product is their billion dollar baby and they defend it at all costs. So, um, you know, it, it was an interesting experience. It, as a trial lawyer, it's, a, it's the exact thing you like to do as a plaintiff's lawyer is go against a big corporation and win like that. Um, you know, I think that people will keep winning the, those trials if they ever happen. That's a, it's a very good case uh, from the plaintiff's perspective. Um, that Roundup causes cancer. And, you know, there, that I'll give, I'll give you one little vignette of something that happened during trial is I was, I was up arguing with the, um, with the, with the judge about something and, and Monsanto's lawyer. And there was a, one of Monsanto's lawyers in the back row and they were typing something up, um, a, a motion to disqualify something that I said or whatever, but they were typing it as I was talking and they were incorporating what I was saying to the judge at that point into the motion. And then they emailed it to another lawyer they had down the hall who printed it out, ran it over, and they handed it to the judge as I was sitting down. It was like a, the most bizarre thing. Um, you know, and, and we're just, we were just, you know, ragtag lawyers who had seven, eight lawyers in their office and we were, we weren't sleeping. We would be up all night. Um, working on this case. It was really, it was really exciting. We rented a VRBO um, and we all stayed together and we just, um, you know, we all stayed in the same place and we just rented a big printer and we made sort of an office room and um, the good old pre pandemic days. <laughs> That's sort of what I wanted to talk about. And you did answer some of those questions, but the trial prep routine is something that I really enjoy hearing about. And I think a lot of our listeners do as well, but it's very different from the sounds of what you were doing to a lot of other lawyers when they have trials. You know, they have one client, they, it might be them and someone else, co-counsel. You guys are in a, you're staying away from your families for months. You're in a rented house. Tell me a little bit, Amy, about how you actually work up your routine and your notes and everything to go to trial? Because it sounds monumental, the amount of work you had to do. Yeah, it really is. I mean, we would have, um, you know, 15, 20 people there. We'd have videographers um, that we would have to hire, 
tech people we'd have to hire. You know, we would do mock trials. We would do um, in San Francisco throughout the trial. At one of the trials, we were in a shadow jury. Um, so we had it live streamed into another room where there was another jury. And um, that jury that we tried to make look exactly like the jury in, in terms of demographics and age and people and ethnicity and things like that. We tried to match the jury. Um, this was in, in one of the state court trials. And um, they would say, OK, well, you, you know, if I, if we were there, we'd want you to say this or we'd want you to say that. And then we did um, we would do mock openings to um, to fake juries and they would give us feedback. We would do mock closings. Um, you know, we would be prepping witnesses uh, in the afternoon that we were going to be putting on in the morning. You know, we, we were we were just running 24 um, seven every day with no break. And then, you know, writing briefs on things that happened, the judge would often say when we left court, um, you know, we'd leave court in the afternoon. He'd say, I want that brief by 7 p.m. or, or whatever. So whatever, um, you know, whatever we had planned that night would have to stop. We had deposition designations that, man, we fought over dep deposition designations just so much. And this was Monsanto's corporate witnesses. They refused to bring any corporate witnesses live. So we had to use all their their deposition designations. And, you know, we would designate this, this portion and that portion, and then we'd fight about it. And then we'd get a ruling and we'd have to have a cut ready within like 20 minutes. So our IT people would be there like cutting out, um, you know, based on what the judge said, it was just, it was complete, complete controlled chaos. Um, and so, you know, if you're going to try one of these big cases, you have to be able to, to just survive in controlled chaos. Cause that's really what it was. And I think we need to definitely have you back on the show just to go through trial prep as an episode on itself, because I think a lot of people would find that so fascinating and different to how they do it. And just the fact that you're able to put that together is just astounding. Um, and the verdict was obviously great. So it's a testament to your skills. But just switching gears a little bit, I want to talk to you about what are some challenges or some great things have happened to you as a female in in the law industry? It's obviously, as you said, you're in a very small pool to begin with. And then as a female trialer, that's the lead trialer, that's a t even tinier, tinier pool. So tell me what it's sort of been like as an experience for you um, in this industry. Yeah, so... Um... You know, my law partner is is a fabulous uh, man who is a feminist in, in his own right and married to a very strong woman and has strong daughters and has me as a law partner. And he's really supported me and my growth in a way that I don't think anyone else ever could have. Um, and he supported me to, to try those cases, to be lead and everything else that I wanted to do. So that's been great um, personally. As you venture out into the mass tort world, um, there's a lot of money at stake. Each one of these cases, I mean, Roundup so far is going to settle for $13 billion just so far. And, you know, Vaginal Mesh, the one that I did right before it settled, probably we're close to probably 15 or $20 billion. You know, look at opioids. It's going to settle for, I don't know, I would guess 30, 40, 50 million billion dollars. So there's a lot of money at stake uh, in these litigations and um, it's very high risk, high reward. And it's it, there's a lot of good old boys network. Um, and so breaking into that and changing the mold, um, there has not just been what you would typically have in a corporation, but it's also people wanting to protect their position uh, <clears throat> in sort of the eventual payouts. So it's been a slow process. Um, but I think that for me, I have had a, a positive experience. Um, a couple of years ago with a good friend of mine named Paul Pinnock at Weitz and Luxembourg, we um, got appointed the first majority female PSC, which was a great accomplishment. I host an annual conference and a year long network called Women in Mass, which is Women in Mass Torts. And we get together in Aspen every year at the St. Regis and Gosh, there's probably 20 or 30 people my first year. And now we're, I think we're over 400 now who, who show up every year. And we just kind of get together and network and, um, and help each other, um, help each other grow, help each other find opportunities, help each other expand. So 
It is changing. It is a slow, slow slog. And sometimes people's words don't match their actions, which I'm sure you guys see in, in your profession as well. Um, but I think that the judges are changing things. The judges are coming around and the judges are realizing that diversity and more women in leadership positions and younger attorneys and that you need to, to change things up a bit. And I think that's happening. And that's really great for our clients, which is the, the most important thing. Um, and it's really great for, for our profession as well. That is great. Amy, before we let you go, we we're going to ask you one final question. What is one piece of advice that you wish you knew five or 10 years ago that you know now? Um, I would tell myself just to continue to be who you are. I mean, I started off um, and to be true to myself and I started off um, this litig or this litigation, this podcast telling you that, you know, I'm the most unlawyerly lawyer around and that's true. And um, it bothered me at first that I wasn't more, of the lawyer mold, but then I realized that that actually is a strength of mine. And, um, and that's, I think what's helped me be successful. And that's probably true in any profession is to just be true to yourself. This is a <clears throat> profession filled with a type overachievers who are used to being the best at everything they do. Um, every lawyer has been a successful person in their life. They're usually excelled in, in grades and in, in, you know, everything academic, they're the smartest of the smartest people. Um, and then you go into the mass tort world and it's the elite of the elite. And so um, I would just say, just continue being yourself and, and you know, go into the beat of your own drum. And, it, and it's really been successful for me to do that. Well, Amy, um, thank you so much for coming on our podcast today. Uh, for our listeners, if, if they wanted to reach out to you, what's the best way for them to get in touch with you? Um, you can just email me, um, Amy, A I M E E dot Wagstaff at andreswagstaff.com. Or you can just Google Amy Wagstaff, Denver lawyer, and you'll find me. Amy, thank you again so much for joining us. Everyone, thank you for listening. And remember to hit that subscribe button and like and review Settlement Nation wherever you listen to this content. It goes a long way to uh, making sure we show up when someone's searching for great legal content. That's it for this one. See you next time right here on Settlement Nation.